Hi everyone, welcome back to the workshop and it's repair time again and this time I've got a Stanford Research Systems a model SR630. This is a 16 channel thermocouple monitor. Uh, you can connect up to 16 thermocouples onto the rear of the unit, I'll show you that in a second. And it's a GPIB controlled device. You can also connect up a printer directly to the unit. There's a Centronics port in the back. And it's got some analog outputs at the back as well for driving various devices. So this device was advertised as faulty. Uh, the ad just said on power up you get some LEDs lighting but they're not complete. And the buttons don't seem to work properly either. A quick look at the back of the unit, you can see the connection for the 16 thermocouples here, uh, the uh, GPIB port, the RS232 port which it has, the analog output's got an alarm output as well, and the Centronics parallel port here. And you will notice they've got some capped on tape onto the back there, that's covering up this mains fuse here. There's obviously a cover missing from this here to stop prying fingers getting uh, into that fuse there and getting electrocuted, they put some captain tape over it. Now as I was manoeuvring this device around the video I did notice it's got a couple of problems. Number one, a small uh, piece of plastic fell out here. That is part of an insulating kit that's a top hat for either a TO220 or a TO3 uh, d device and well why that's lying about inside I'm not really sure. It can only mean that the screw that was through it and the nut has come off. What I've also found is, whoa, look what just fell out, a nut. Well, that's obviously part of this insulating kit, I would think, so there's going to be a screw in there as well. Wow. Well, I'm obviously not going to power it up. I'm going to take the cover off. Let's take a look inside and see what we can find. Okay, and here we go. Now, if you do hear some noises in the background, the workshop aircon is switching itself off and on today because it is rather hot. So. Apologies for that. Yep, somebody's been in here before. There's a few screws missing. But I'll just take them all off so we can take a look inside. Now, right, let's take a look at the top side first. Okay, and here we are inside the unit here. It's a rather nice looking large PCB on the bottom there and a small plug-in board there for the GPIB serial and printer port there with the ribbon cable coming down. You've got the transformer here mounted on the side and down onto the PCB there. You've got the, the three bridge rectifiers in the corner there. This will be a large bulk capacitor there on that power supply. You've got some more uh, electrolytic capacitors underneath this ribbon here that goes away off to the display. And I can just show you them down and under there. And curiously, on this side here you can actually see this one here and it looks to be a little leaky on the top side there. So we will need to replace at least that one there. The processor used is a Z80. That's quite standard for Stanford Research. I did actually repair a different Stanford Research uh, device many years ago and it was ZAA as well and it's tucked under, way underneath the uh, uh, transformer there, you can see that 40 pin dip there and next to it is the RAM and the ROM, with the PROM there with the label on it and next to that is a counter timer chip there, the D7105-4C. Over at this side of the board, this is all be the, all the uh, acquisition hardware, and down on here, the TC850 CPL. That's a 15-bit A to D converter. They are old school A to D. And underneath there, we've got a whole bunch of relays there. That's obviously obviously for switching in and out the thermocouple as required. But what about this nut and this insulating kit? Well, I found it actually, and it's actually down under 
It's down here. I don't know if you can see that there. There's a TO220 device down there and it's missing its nut and obviously that insulating kit. So that'll be relatively easy to put that back on. Let's just hope that that nut floating around all the circuitry here hasn't done any damage. So let's lift the cover on the bottom side. Oh, it's tight. There we go. Oh. And that looks like an auto-rooted board to me. Um, this device is from 1995. Some of the date codes and some of the chips on the other side were dated 95. Uh, so yeah, that'll be an auto-rooted board, I would have thought. And over here, wow. That's not looking too clever. We've got a whole load of flux residue there or even leakage there. Not really sure. And a bodge wire. Somebody has been in here before. Uh, but yeah, those electrolytic capacitors there underneath that ribbon on the other side do look like they all need replaced. And you can see the insulating kits for the bank of uh, five TO220 devices there. You can see the three pins. Uh, connections on each one and yeah I wonder if someone's been in here before trying to fix the power supply maybe and couldn't get it working or something like that so the missing screw is I think on this one here but I think to get at it properly I think I'll try and take off the front panel that give me some good access to this corner of the board where I think I should concentrate my initial works there <laughs> Oh, looks like the bezel just comes off with those screws and this screw just fell out and there we go there's the small screws for the TU220s and there's where that one should go but I won't put it in just yet I do want to check and clean up this board and check for any dead shorts on that power supply so I think they give me a little bit more access I'm going to disconnect this ribbon cable here from the display and it'll give me better access underneath Okay, with that peel back, I've got access to those TO220 devices and they're all regulators. 7905, that's a minus 5 volt. A 7805, that's a plus 5 volt. A 7915, that's a minus 15 volt. A 7815, that's a plus 15 volt. And at the end there, a 7805, a plus 5 volt regulator. And they do look rather cruddy on that top side there. I suspect that uh, some leaky caps have just been uh, contaminating the air etc around those regulator pins there and has left it with some residue across the pins. So I think for a start I'm just going to replace all five of these caps here. I suspect that they're on the inputs to all those regulators there from the bridge rectifiers down in the corner there and this largest one is probably on that 5 volt one there the positive 5 volt one there because that's going to be the the uh, majority of these ICs on this board here are going to be powered by that plus 5 volt so yeah I'll replace all of these and uh, clean up the board uh, I'm not going to replace the regulators I'm going to assume that they're okay at the moment we'll check them for dead shorts and we'll take it from there so let's go across some of these regulator pins here and let's see what we've got. Well, none of them are dead short. Okay, let's remove these electrolytic caps. Now they could have been replaced. And that's maybe why there's flux all over them, but I'm not taking any chances. So let's get them removed. Well, there's the electrolytics removed, and yeah, this does seem to be the worst of the lot. That one's uh, quite bad with uh, gunk oozing out of it. The other ones, well, yeah, that one's uh, definitely been leaking as well, down through the leg holes there. 
Well, with the caps removed, looking at the PCB, it is in a fair bit of a state there. There's gunk all over the PCB, especially at this end, uh, where that leaky capacitor was, that bad one. And the tracks do look to be corroded uh, quite a bit as well. They're still intact by the looks of it, but I will need to clean it up with some acetone, put some PCB cleaner, and let's see how bad it is and what sort of repair we need to make. That bodge wire on the other side of the board might have been due to a previous repair. Right, let's get in with the PCB brush. Now, a couple of the holes on those capacitors did look to be in bad shape. I think uh, one of them actually pulled through with the solder sucker. So I'll need to work out how to fix that. So obviously I can't solder from the top side. And with the bottom side pad missing, that's not going to be so easy, but I'm sure I'll work out something. I would like to remove the board from the case, but uh, there's quite a bit of wiring underneath that other end. Uh, not so easy, so I think I'll, I should manage to get away with it with the repair, if this is all it needs, anyway. Well, the PCB is in worse state than I initially thought. Uh, after cleaning up the residue uh, from that top side of the PCB, I do actually have some tracks that are missing. If you look at uh, this leg here of this electrolytic, there's a track comes off it here and there's a way along here and down here and you can see that this corner here is actually missing completely and there is actually another track that comes up alongside it it's missing as well it disappears at this point here it goes away along here and there's actually a via there it's uh, a little bit hard to see and there are some other uh, repairs that look like have been done previously you can see that this uh, via on the board here underneath this electrolytic here Somebody's put a bit of bodge wire down through a via and onto the track there, just soldered onto the end there. And that goes down through onto the other side of the PCB. So I suspect that this electrolytic had uh, corroded sometime in the past and it had actually burnt away that via there, therefore disconnecting both sides of the PCB there. This end of the board here is not in such a bad state. It does look like I'll need to come up with a plan to actually uh, repair those tracks. I don't really want to put too many bodge wires on the other side of the PCB. It just looks a bit, uh, uh, well, it doesn't look so good. So what I think I'll try to do is repair the top side here. Um, now there is a, actually an additional problem and that is that some of these holes on the PCB for the legs of the electrolytic capacitors, they may have disappeared. How well through hole plated are these holes on the PCB? I do know that on the other side of the board, I'm not sure if it's this one or this hole here, the top side pads actually pulled off. Well, to repair these tracks, I really needed to get comfortable and get in about nice and close, so I didn't have any choice but to disassemble the unit and I managed to do enough that I didn't need to desolder any of the hookup wires at the rear of the PCB, just cut a few tie wraps, take out a few screws and managed to put the chassis off to the side there so that I can get in amongst these uh, tracks on the PCB there and uh, start repairing. So I've taken the fiberglass pen and I've given them a good rub down so that I can expose as much as the copper as I can and I'll make a start at running some of the Kynar wire which I've got here and I'll use that to repair the tracks. This stuff's small enough that it should be able to go down some of the vias if required and uh, still manage to put the legs of the capacitors down through the hole. But we'll try that out and we'll see how we get on. Well, there we go. Five pieces of Kynar in there. And yep, there was about three broken traces for sure. 
uh, ranging from this transistor way over here uh, right across underneath those capacitors there so some of the wires were really corroded but they're all right on the other side of the PCB so by putting the kynar down through the hole I'm kind of bringing that via back to life so next thing to do is whilst I'm here before I put the capacitors and new capacitors on the board I am actually going to go along these regulators and just check for any dead shorts or anything like that and here's the other side of the board all soldered up and uh, the regulators all seem to check out at least there's no dead shorts anyway and I just need to clean up the PCB here and you can see some of the uh, kynars come through this via here which is heavily corroded and I've just bent it over and soldered it on, scraped off a little bit of solder mask on that track there and just soldered it down onto that track and the same with a few of the others as well um, and I've beeped it out and all the tracks look okay now so I'll go away and clean up that residue from that PCB there and we'll uh, fit it back into the chassis and do a little bit more testing and attempt to power up. Right, that's all the regulators fitted, top hats fitted and uh, as you can see that's the capacitors from the top side so I just want to run along the regulators mate, there and make sure that the top hats are properly in place. Sometimes they can get nipped and the screw can touch the tab of the uh, TO220 packages so I just want to make sure that we are all insulated 8.7 meg, yep yeah. 10 meg, yep yeah. uh, 3k, something like that ah, that one's dead short I'm going to take a look at that one and the last one, that one's dead short as well. Now it could be that that's meant to be shorted, but I won't know until I just loosen the screws on those uh, TU220 packages, just to make sure. It could be that the uh, ground plane on the PCB is earthed to the chassis, um, via the mounting screws. I won't know until I actually loosen those screws again and retest. Well it's looking okay. I did uh, remove the screws and top hatch as you can see. Bent the two 220 packages away from the chassis and they're still dead short. So yep I think it's the mounting of the PCB. And if you look a little bit closely at the top hats they do look to be intact, they don't have any squished edges to them, so they are fine as well. Right, that's it all back together again, ribbon cables back in place, and uh, all the screws back in and tight, transformers back in and tight, and I've measured across the 5 volt rail, just across one of those 74 series ICs down here, and it's looking good, no dead shorts. Let me get my little bit of foam out where I was protecting the transformer on the PCB. Everything looks ready to give it a power up. So I'll go away, I'll measure across the AC input, just make sure that I'm not getting a dead short, make sure I'm seeing the primary on the transformer. If I am, then we'll attempt to power up. Right, now I was just checking the fuse and it is the right one, half amp fuse and it does look okay. Uh, but I did want to take a look at this little card that's slotted in below the fuse and it's actually the voltage selector. It's a little PCB that you would turn round either way or over the other way depending on what voltage you want. Now the main 5 volt regulator, there's two 5 volt regulators down on the board there and the one closest to me at this end is the main 5 volt regulator that powers the logic by the looks of it. So if I go on to one of those ICs there, the 5 volt supply and start winding it up we'll see what we get and we've got a volt there we've got 100 volts now almost 5 volts, let me check some of the other regulators That's plus 13, that's the plus 15 volt regulator, it should be. Let me check the input to the 5 volt regulator, that's 6.5 volts, that's good. The minus 15 volt regulator should be coming up nearly 
and oh wait a minute we've got power yes so let me just keep the supply going up 200 volts let me just check the regulators 5 volts and the input is 9 volts that's good and the 15 volt rail yep 15 and input to that 20 volts that's fine as well and have we got a minus 15 volt rail yes we do and the other 5 volt rail sorry that's a minus that's yeah that's a plus meant to be plus 5 volts that's a, a different ground on that one there I believe and try this other regulator at the end here yeah I think those two at the end there plus and minus five must be floating so I'll need to check that out so let me put power off this now and let's turn it over on its side and measure that regulators directly so let me put power on again A dodgy IEC connector I think right so let's go on to this one here this is a minus 5 volt one so the input and ground pins should be swapped so if I go across that to there sorry this to here yep minus 5 volts great and on the other one yep plus 5 volts so those two regulators are working as well so all the regulators are working fine and Ah, like a dodgy connector in the back I think okay we've got a problem now it was powering up I was getting something on the display uh, but every now and then it was cutting out and so I was happy that I've got the 240 volt going into OK so I got rid of my variable transformer and I've just hooked up 240 volts direct direct from my workshop um, RCD uh, which was powering the uh, variable transformer anyway and it's a 10 milliamp RCD a nice low current one uh, just for use in the workshop for testing and every now and then it was tripping but the curious thing is it was tripping with this power switch in the off position so there's some current to get leaking away down the ground and it's managing to trip the RCD even though the power switched off the transformer is isolated now there is something on the back of that uh, IEC connector on the back there I'm not sure if it's a filter or what it is but uh, I'll have to remove this board on the top there get access to underneath there and let's take a look and see what's causing the leakage and tripping my RCD let's take a look here ah yes we've got a line filter so I suspect that we've got a problem with that line filter um, I don't think it'll be anything other than that because I mean the AC coming out of that just goes to the voltage selection network and the primaries of the uh, transformer but with the power switch off and I know the power switch works there is no current basically going to the transformer so it really has to be the line filter that's got a problem now as you can see you've got, obviously you've got the mains coming in the bottom there and you've got your live and neutral uh, coming out here but it's integrated into this uh, fuse and voltage selectors. This grey cable here goes away off to the power switch, double pole switch and I've disconnected the feed going to the switch which came from the line filter so that's the the basically the live and neutral connection there going away off to the switch and back from the switch is on this red and green now the switch is in the off position right now and if I just put my ohmmeter across the white wire going off to the switch now the white wire is totally isolated the switch is off at this end and this, the wires unsoldered at this end and I'm getting okay 50 meg but on the black wire I am getting 250k 270k now that switch 
is leaking down to ground. Oh, but wait a minute. Before I do that, just noticed on the back side of the switch, there's this little foam pad. I wonder if it's breaking down and it's causing a problem. Right, that's the pad removed and the PCB cleaned up with a little bit of IPA. Let's try that again. Nope, we're still getting the 270k, so it's not the pad. So here is the back of the switch, the pins that go through to the PCB, and they're all soaking wet. And that is basically the insides of a capacitor that's leaked out and under that switch there. And if you look in the PCB down there, you can see it's soaking as well. So, yeah, um, the switch might be okay. I'll need to give it a clean, but uh, hopefully it's just that top side of the PCB where the capacitor near, nearest to it leaked all under it. Right, the switch is a sealed unit, but I've cleaned it up anyway, but you never know what might have made its way inside it. So I've got it off now. So let's try across some of the contacts. That side there is leaking. Yeah. Well, I think I'll take a look inside this switch, actually. I know I don't have a spare one. Yeah. Let's see if we can crack it open and take a look inside. It does look to have a removable top to it, but uh, what it'll do to those pins, I'm not sure. So let me go and try that now. Well, it doesn't look too bad inside, but... Yeah, but there's, ah yes, you can see it, it's wet in and around here, I can see that, you probably can't see that on camera, but uh, yeah, it needs a good old bath to clean all that up. So I'll away and do that now, looks like we can save this switch. Ideally I'd get the ultrasonic cleaner out and uh, use that, but that's just a bit too much trouble I think. Well, actually, I just went ahead and stripped it down completely. I wasn't happy that uh, some of the gunk was uh, down down that side of that pin there. The other ones look okay, but just that one there, so it does need a little bit of an extra clean-up, I think. Okay, that's the switch back together again. And let's just see how it operates. Let me keep my fingers away from the pins. That's on at the moment. Off. Yes, and that was the dodgy side as well, so that's fine, and the other pole, yes, no more 270k or anything like that, so let me just check this side, that's it on, yep. Right, that's the switch in, wired up, and I'm wired back up to the line filter. Everything's back as it should be. Switch is in the off position, so let me just go down onto the wires on that live and neutral. And yep, completely open circuit. Yep, and with the switch in the on position. Yep. Yep. That's that fixed. Perfect. Let's power up again. But before I power it back up, I do want to put something over the back of that power switch there. Uh, let's see if I can find something that can go on there. Yep, yeah, and I've found a sticky pad of sorts to go on the back there. So we should be good to go. And I will have to do something about that back cover as well. Something missing there. I'm going to have to make up something there. So let's get power on to it now and see what happens. And let's switch it on. Yes! And no immediate tripping anyway. And we've got open written there. Is that a duff segment? Maybe. A little bit of a flicker going on there. I think that's meant to say open. A couple of segments missing. And I can hear the relays clicking as I'm changing the channel at the back there. So we've got something. But I do think that... Uh, LED array, something wrong with that. So let me see if it's got a power on self test anywhere. 
or a segment check. And there's definitely a couple missing. There's some missing over here as well. So the ad was right. There is some segments missing on the LED. So it looks like I'll need to take out that display board. Well, the segments have come alive again. Have we got a dodgy connection somewhere? I presume it's on the display board because it wasn't like it was a whole row. It seems all right now. Wow. I think I will take off that display board. Ah, we've got a flickering one there. Beginning to go. Hopefully, yeah. We zoom in on that. You can just see that both of those two there just starting to flicker away there. And I hope it's not the LEDs, although with a unit this age it's probably an off-the-shelf LED if it's not a, a dry joint. And it's probably on the actual segments themselves because this one's okay so the row drive or the row scan yeah, I think I'll take off the display board and let's take a look. Right, here's the display board. And that's it out. Well, it's definitely off the shelf LEDs. And the soldering looks to be quite good on the back. Well, since more than one of those LEDs in the front on the same row appear to be flickering. I'm also going to take a look at the actual drive signals uh, to the LED and I pulled off the ribbon cable that uh, connects to the display and look what I've spotted down on these end pins down here. Let's zoom in on that. Hopefully you can see that, but it does look rather wet round about those pins down there. And curiously, right next to that capacitor there, the one that was the worst and probably blew its guts all over the place. So I suspect that actually uh, the gunks got onto the pins there and it's actually sort of semi-shorting out those pins. And perhaps those pins there are uh, responsible, or one or two of the pins anyway, for that particular row drive. So I'll need to clean those up. Um, hopefully I won't need to take off the connector to get underneath it. And actually, on the actual ribbon itself, it's a bit wet as well, round about there as well. So I'll need to clean that up as well. Right, we've got power back on again. And at the moment the segments are lit. You probably can't see that because the contrast isn't very good. Let me just uh, get something that might help. Yeah, that does help. And they are lit at the moment. It seemed to fade after it had been on some minutes. So let me just leave it for a few minutes and I'll come back and we'll see if it's faded anyway, those segments. But... Still working at the moment. Well, it's been on a good 15 minutes now, and it looks like that's it fixed. I'll put it back together and we'll take it from there. Okay, that's power back on again after I've just uh, reassembled the unit, and the segments seem to be working okay. And let's see if the unit actually works. So I've hooked up a thermocouple to channel 1 in the back. And uh, this is the uh, business end of it here. And uh, I'll just go down to channel 1 and see what happens. I've got no idea how this thing works. Yes! 25 degrees. Let me put my finger on the end there. Yes! <laughs> it's working. Oh. There's some clicking relays there. I'm not sure what it's doing well it's just failed again this time it didn't trip the RCD in the workshop it tripped the RCD in the house which effectively blew out the whole workshop so I've reset everything again 
And so we've still got a major problem with this instrument. And no, I don't think it's the power switch again. What I actually think it is, it's the line filter. And what I think's happening is it's breaking down and it's just tripping the RCD. So I've got no choice but to replace it. So I've managed to get a hold of a line filter that hopefully should fit into here. But first of all, let's remove this one, see what size of uh, opening we've got in that rear case that the new one can fit into. Okay, that's the old filter removed. Now the problem I do have is finding a filter with exact dimensions that will slot nicely into the rear of the unit here. And here's the candidate. It's just a standard size inline filter and it's the uh, letterbox size. But unfortunately, it doesn't fit. It's slightly too high by maybe one or two millimetres, which means I'd have to go and file down the back of the case here. But worse than that, it's not quite wide enough. So the clips that hold it in place on the sides here uh, wouldn't even touch the sides because there's a... Uh, just too much play there. So what am I going to do? So I went on to eBay to see if I could find anything and believe it or not I found a replacement 6J4 the identical uh, line filter and voltage selector that's in the unit right now. So let's get this one unboxed and let's start wiring up. There's a few solder connections on the back here for the voltage selection, the primary, the transformer, and of course the uh, main uh, live and neutral coming out of the filter itself. And hopefully that will solve my problem. Now the other bonus about having a brand new item is that it's got the, the back cover on which covers up the fuse, etc. when you've got the line cord plugged in. Brilliant. Right, that's it all wired up. So let's check that we're getting a good earth connection first of all. Yep, yeah, perfect. Now let's check the live and neutral to chassis. Yep, yeah, completely open circuit there. Completely open circuit there. Let's uh, turn the switch off. Not that that should make any difference. Yep, yeah, that's fine. And back on again. Yep. So this time I'm going to just switch the switch on and off. Let's see if we can make that meter jump at all. Nope, that's fine. And the other side. That's looking good to me. A nice clean switch. And we should see about 120 ohms, I think it was, across the input. 112, yeah. So that's the primary of the transformer. So the voltage selection's working good. And I can see through the window there, it is actually selected for 240 volts anyway. So let me set up the camera, let's get it powered up, and let's see if we're getting that funny glitching on the temperature readout, but more importantly, let's make sure that my RCDs don't trip again. Okay, here we go again, ready for power up, and I've got the thermocouple hooked up again to channel one. So let's power it up, and we've got power, and the LED looks fine, and we're on channel one already, and we've got a temperature readout. So let me just uh, put my fingers on the thermocouple. We're definitely not getting any glitching now. We can hear relays clicking every now and then. Maybe that's going past set points because it's definitely not glitching on the display. Yeah, it looks like when it goes past 30 degrees. So maybe there's a high limit set. Like I said, I don't know how you use this thing yet. Let's go back up again. But no funny negative numbers there anyway. That's looking great. Yeah, a lot happier now that I've got the new line filter. Switch is cleaned out. I think we've got a good unit now. So let me go ahead and put it in its case again. I'll off camera or run through all uh, 16 channels, make sure they're okay responding just like this one. We'll see where we go from there. And just like that, there it is all boxed up, ready to go. And I'm on channel 16 now. And yes, fingers on the thermocouple. 
and it seems to be working great. And just one last thing to do, I think I'll give this panel a little bit of a clean up with some IPA and see if I can't get rid of some of those little marks. And there we go, another tool for the workshop. Hopefully you'll see this one when I do some tests on my reflow oven. Thanks for watching.